There aren't a lot of things the biblical editors got right, but I do like the way they ordered the epistles. Basically, they went longest to shortest, so at least through the Pauline stuff, each one is less of a pain in the ass than the last one. Now, that does sacrifice chronological order, which makes the whole exercise of reading these things a little bit less coherent, but as we'll soon learn, there's no order that was going to make these motherfuckers <laughs> coherent, so kudos for letting me get the worst of it out of the way first. That's why I've been enjoying this book so much, the ordering. Yo, That's yeah. why the Bible's so good. I Mystery solved. And, of course, it just wouldn't be the babble without the assistance of the lovely Lucinda Lusion. So, Lucinda, welcome back. Oh, thanks and everything. But, you you know, you really have no way of knowing that it wouldn't be the babble without my assistance. We haven't really tested that statement. Oh, We're yeah. all about scientific skepticism on this nice show. Nice try. Yeah, no, but my I still haven't one. forgotten this shit was your idea. So, <sighs> why don't you get us started with Paul's last and longest epistle, which is known to history as the Book of Romans. So, the letter starts with a bit of a humble brag by Paul. Uh, then some sanctimonious teabagging of the addressees. So for the first dozen and a half verses, it seems like it might be kind of a normal thing. And then Paul starts in on the wicked folks, and it never, ever, ever gets normal again. It's no, it, it, you don't have to weigh the is this one going to be crazy question for very long. So mm -hmm. first Paul proves God's existence with the trees are pretty apologetic. <laughs> Airtight. Tells everyone that non-believers have no excuse. After all, they've seen trees, they've seen worms. How could you look at that and not naturally conclude that an eternal anthropomorphized spirit that wants you to stick to missionary sex and not jack off created out of a void and redeemed humanity by killing a Jew? Fucking obviously. Look at the trees. And then we learned that God made all the gay people because he was mad at them for not believing in him. This might have been the weirdest part of the New Testament so far. Seriously. It was really fucked up. And they finally, by the way, get around to the lesbian bashing. Mm -hmm. So it's good to see Paul being more inclusive than the Old Testament, you know, getting everybody involved. Open minded. Yeah, yeah, but he was clearly confused about how God wrath works. This is how he describes the punishment for, I'm assuming, Dutch rudders and butt sex. Quote, <laughs> men with men working that which is unseemly and the receiving Dutch in rudders, themselves yeah. the recompense of their error, which was meat. And <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, he seems to think that the penalty for being gay is the penis inside you. That's more like a reward for a lot yeah, of people. Right. Well, generally, yeah. Uh, well, and if no I'm reading this about. right, God actually turns you gay as a punishment for not believing in him mm -hmm. and then gives you the dick. So if he wanted, he could have given you the dick without making you gay first, <laughs> but I guess that's why they say he's so merciful. So much more sense. Yes. And what a bizarrely inclusive list of every kind of wickedness we get in uh, chapter 129. Murder, deceit, and ruthless listed right along there with gossipy and boastful. <laughs> Bashful and dark. Yeah, yeah right. right, exactly. <laughs> like, what? Kind of odd. We also learn early on that Paul is just as shitty with analogies as everyone else in the Bible. He's trying to say at one point, he's trying to talk about like obeying the rules and not just bitching about people who break them. And instead of something nice and pithy like karate here, karate here, karate never here, <laughs> he goes with this tortured and extremely long attempt at a circumcision analogy <laughs> and he's saying but if the Jews break the law he will become uncircumcised in God's eyes and if the uncircumcised person obeys the law then they will become circumcised it's just Right, right. But since he knows that being good doesn't make your foreskin fall off, he has to go back and expand it by pointing out that I'm not talking about real dick chopping circumcision. No, I'm yeah, talking about, not. you know, the spirit foreskins for a couple of Figurative. verses. Yeah, for, for a couple of verses. It's probably a good, you know, boardroom decision they made on this one. They're sitting around their shitty little table trying to figure out how to get the Romans on board with the Bible beta version, and Paul says, maybe I'll write them a letter. You know, really just like playing up that new rule about how they can still get into heaven without cutting a piece of their penis off. Do you think they'll like I, I feel like they're going to like that. I mean, it's going to make us look kind of stupid theory. over here, but I feel like we used to scare the fuck out of people with that part, like all the time. So I think it's important that we remind them about the new, you know, keeping their entire penis thing, that that's an option. If we're picking our best new selling point, it just seems like. You know, you put that on the cover, so right? Like you focus the marketing, I right. think so. And I'm that, writing them a letter. <laughs> and that sets up the most theologically dubious proposition in all of Christianity. This notion that the only thing that counts in the end is whether or not you're Christian. Right. He basically spends two chapters saying those who are evil will be punished. But then he does a 180 and reminds everybody that none of that shit really matters because doing good means accepting Jesus as your Savior and nothing else. Right, and he also lets you know that if you think that's bullshit, you're damned by God. 
Right. And he spends a lot of time on the circumcision bit. And yes. that part I understand because he's trying to tell people they've been mutilating their dicks for no reason for the last 3,000 years. <laughs> that really strikes me as the kind of thing you want to ease people into. Spend a little time on that. Yeah. 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 And I'm not sure he did enough to make sure they feel like being Jewish and having the mutilated penis still counts. Like, you want to address that. You want to tell them there's value in it. Basically, all they got was this vague promise that it's like, you know, showing up at the Heaven Club and you already left a tip for the guy with the clipboard. There's no guarantees, but still can't hurt. Yeah, you got to make the new game system still play the old game system's games. It's just, mm-hmm. that's, they should so, have known that. He also has to sell the Misery is Awesome concept in the next chapter, so it's a pretty hard pitch all the way through. Yeah, and he uses the... the sp- proto depok logic he's twisting himself in circles with it constantly trying to justify it it's it, like uh, he's going like oh well see since it was adam's fault that we were all held worthy sinners to begin with it makes perfect sense for only one person to redeem all of us but in so doing not stop us from actually being sinners or being miserable since god couldn't think of a better way to generate hope than withholding hope from most of the people about all the stuff that they hope that they have Right, right. God was punishing you for something someone else did. So it makes perfect sense that he would stop <laughs> punishing you by killing a different someone else. <laughs> but That's only for a couple of days, it. yeah. It's like, listen to your idiot college friend. They took mushrooms for the first time, and I think they could see the invisible fabric of the universe. Everything's mm-hmm. connected right, all yeah. of a sudden. And Adam ate the fruit with the tree, and Kirk Cameron said Jesus had a, he was hung from a tree, and he died <laughs> for life so we could live for death in a giant circle of life death <laughs> jesus yeah. good and evil yeah. trees fruit space time jesus <laughs> somebody hit him with a stun gun yeah why right. do we even have that yeah. like, God, this whole fucking thing and like for several chapters in a row he starts off the chapter by pointing out another fatal flaw in his twisted web of pseudo logic that he never fixes mm-hmm. well and it keeps being the same one he keeps Basically, saying yeah but if that's true why shouldn't we just do whatever we want Right. And then he'll go off on a Jesus dying and being reborn for a bit and then land right back where he started feeling once more compelled to say, okay, but if that's true, why shouldn't we just all do what we want? Right. Yes. <laughs> feel, like, feel like that guy can die for everyone's sins and then get resurrected. We just saw that happen. So wouldn't we have to be idiots to just use him the one time? <laughs> right. right. Exactly. Ridiculous. Once you introduce time travel it's into the story, they do. could just keep using yeah. that every time they... So just a quick example of what we're talking about. Not exactly quick, but here's Paul explaining why Christians can't technically sin because when you're sinning, you're not a Christian. Okay. So this is from Romans seven fourteen to 20, the New Revised Standard Version. Quote, For we know the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me, that is, my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what Jeez. I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells. This, I'm not just Dr. reading Seuss. the same words. It, like, right, exactly. Yeah. It's just that kind of goddamn Susian jabberwocky <laughs> for 16 chapters. It's like a John ah. Galt speech on the radio. Oh, my God. <laughs> Awful. He, yeah, so good luck teasing a point out of this shit. But as near as I can tell, in chapter 80, he explains that Christians get superpowers, and mm-hmm. they can't sin. In right. the same way that Richard Nixon couldn't break the law. Pretty okay. much, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Except... Gerald Ford didn't pardon Nixon until after he uh, committed the crimes. Right, so, makes a difference. Yeah, kind of. I mean, this is more like the Patriot Act of the New Testament. Like, right. pre, we can break whatever law yeah, we want. exactly. Now, this is also the, the chapter that gives us all that weird predestination shit that makes the Calvinists and J-dubs extra crazy. And once again undermines his central message that not sinning matters. Right, kind yeah, exactly. And it's just all over the map like that through the whole book. In chapter 9... Paul cites God being a complete dick to Esau and the Pharaoh to underscore the point that God reserves the right to fuck you in the ass whenever he feels like it, regardless of whether you're a good person or not. Just to be clear, the ass fucking won't happen for any good reasons. No. Yeah, have anything to do with your actions, it's just part of the script for a good handful of people. That's mm-hmm. that's going to happen. Yeah, nothing, apparently. No improvising your way around the butt sex from God. That's definitely <laughs> in the scene. It's right. in the cards. Right, and that forces Paul to address the whole, well, why'd that asshole make me a sinner if he didn't want me to sin problem? Uh, which he brushes aside by saying, who is the clay to question the sculptor? 
<laughs> which is slightly nicer way of saying quit asking fucking questions. What about what, what about the other sculptors that say Christian God is a shitty artist? What did <laughs> I just say about questions and about not asking that? that guy. Yeah. <laughs> there also seems to be a concerted effort to justify hijacking the Jewish religion and using it to hate Jews. Uh, well, it's a running theme. But yeah. Yeah, but I will say that that that's where he makes his best argument because what what Paul he does basically here is he just digs through the Old Testament and he says read this shit. Tell me that God doesn't <laughs> hate the Jews. <laughs> This is yeah. their yeah. fucking book. Clearly, he hates. That's a hard one to argue yeah. with. Yeah. So, so that's happening. We're going to hate the Jews, but we're not going to resent them. We're not going to resent them. They're an important piece of history. God had to choose them and then realize they were assholes and then smite them in order for us to get brought in on the heaven game thing. Now yeah. we're in on it, which is good. <laughs> the Jews are like Tim Couch and Ryan Leaf or like <laughs> Sam Boot. First round busts are going to happen. Even to God. Even to God. Even God misses Michael Jordan once in a while. But now we're rebuilding the franchise with no more Jews, so things are looking up. Apparently. Yeah, he even explains why God would offer salvation to a bunch of Gentiles if the Jews were his chosen people. Turns out he's just trying to make the Jews jealous. Yeah, that was a bizarre bit of theological three-card Monty God (laughs) was playing there, right? So apparently God is using the fact that the Jews aren't believing him correctly as his means of saving the Gentiles, which will make the Jews so envious that they'll start being Gentiles, in which time he can save them because they'll be believing in him correctly again. That's the plan the all-knowing guy came up with. I guess so. And then in chapter 12, Paul finds room to squeeze in a few sentences that actually have good advice and say meaningful stuff like feeding your enemies and loving your neighbors right. and all that and fun For stuff. a second, but then he immediately fucks that up by explaining that you should always submit to the king because if God didn't want that person to be king, he wouldn't have made him king in the first place. Mm-hmm. Even a heathenist black guy. All that means mm-hmm. is the end times are about to happen. Just roll with it. Relax. Listen to Mr. It's in Norris. The wacky script. And I, I love that when it comes time for Paul to list the Ten Commandments, he sounds like a congressman getting interviewed by Stephen Colbert. You know, he says, <laughs> you know, when God said, thou shalt not commit adultery or murder or covet or steal or all that other shit that Moses <laughs> said God said. He's just... <laughs> Yeah, so either he couldn't remember them or he'd be bothered to look them up. Or he agrees with me that the other six are kind of stupid. Well, right, because he wasn't, like, saying this off the cuff. He was writing a fucking letter. (laughs) It's like the Rick Perry version of the Nine Commandments, or is it ten? (laughs) Yeah, no, it is ten. It is ten. There is one more, but it doesn't matter what it says. I'm getting rid of that one, too. (laughs) All the commandments. Everybody just try to blow your neighbor, and we'll be fine. That's the important thing. That's how I try to love myself. We would be fine. And, and, And then listen to this. Just weird, random, anti-vegetarian shit talk that opens up chapter 14. <laughs> he said, for, out of nowhere, it just says, some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. <laughs> what the fuck, dude? Why you got to be a dick like that? Yeah, right. By the way, this part, it also says you have to be nice to atheists and you're not supposed to argue with them. It does, yeah, yes. Yeah. It says first line. So if you come across a street preacher and won't stop barking at people, just remind them. Romans 14.1, asshole. It says... Basically, shut the fuck up because I said so. And tell them that's what it says. Make them look it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't really say that. Does, does it shit? It doesn't say really close. It doesn't say the F word in here, does it? First of all. <laughs> then, then Paul basically spends a chapter explaining why he hasn't visited the people in Rome. Right. So he basically, it's Paul begging out of a class reunion for 32 verses. Yeah, exactly, basically. exactly. It's like he's writing his mom. No, Ma, as soon as I go to Spain, I'm going to come by and see. I, I promise, I promise. And then he tacks on a bit at the end of the letter that says, Oh, yeah, and by the way, here are 48 people I promised you would take good care of when you got this letter. So <laughs> give them some food, place to stay, and shit like that. You know, So apparently that habit of hiding the request for a favor at the end of a long, boring correspondence isn't new. No, nor is ending your letter with stuff like, oh, and Bob and Tim say hi, and Grandma oh says she misses God, you. What's the shit like that? It was crazy. pages. About halfway through the it chapter, you hear the Oscars band start playing. <laughs> right? I wish they would have been you're done, there. Thank you, yeah. You're done. Like, yeah. Yeah, and hidden in the middle of it, it's a quick reminder to shun all the people that disagree with his interpretation of God, because fuck other people with other religions. Yes, and then it went back to his producer and his right. agent. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly, like the band had been fuck playing God. for a while by the time this thing mercifully oh, ended, with the reader asking, what the fuck was the point of that? <laughs> Like, I mean, like, okay, so, like, theoretically, it seemed like it was trying to answer some basic questions about Christian theology and clarify a few issues, but if you take the time to actually follow Paul's weird 
maze of logic, you realize that it never actually does. Mm -mm. And who the fuck writes a 7,000-word letter? Right. <laughs> For reference, by the way, that would be like get, getting a 12-page email from somebody. Yeah, I, you know, it doesn't have the response that the Roman Christians sent back to Paul, but I'm guessing <laughs> it just said <laughs> TLDR. Seems like there would be a title for the book. I right. think that would good, be good more accurate, page. Well, especially for the Christians. Now, the good news is that, they, like I said, they order the Pauline epistles from longest to shortest, but the bad news is that we're going to be doing both Corinthians together, so together uh. those lives will be longer than this boring <laughs> fucker was. So rest up. I'm pretty sure there's a little bit more mind-numbing to come. Of course there is. Gentile Manji. <laughs>